All right, here we go. The grand finale. And the first thing I want to say about it is, if you just read the chapter, it kind of like, what? But you got to think in context of the rest of the message. It starts off with Christ in you, right? When God saw, field, uh, saw fit to reveal Christ in me, Paul says, that preach them in the Gentiles. And he taught, you know, it goes through the whole scripture about the Judaizing of the gospel. You know, they come in and say, now you need to obey the Sabbath. Now you need to do this. And we're in chapter three, which I think is so pivotal. When he talks about, you know, the God's poured out his Holy Spirit lavishly and did miracles in you. Did he do it by, you know, hearing a message or by the works of the law? He did it by a message. And this message has got such power. And that's the point. We need to get back to the message and let that message change our lives. And then we got to chapter five, which I, I love. It says, when there any is legalistic thought in you, it causes problems in our life. And, I mean, I just kind of had to bring it up. Verse 16, cravings of the flesh, right? Catalyst. Verse 17, we elaborated on that. And Keisha did such a wonderful job talking about catalysts. Well, the law of works features in your mind is a catalyst for disaster. And it says all the things that manifest in the flesh when we have a legalistic mindset. Instead of the faith mindset of the finished work, what did God accomplish on the cross? And how are we included in that? He did the work. I have to, you got to keep repeating. Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He has taken away the sin of the world. All of it in one swoop. That is the cross. That's a scandal, by the way. So anyway, verse with that in mind, with you know talking about the Judaizers and in, in dissecting grace and law, because that's what this is about. We'll start in chat, it's verse one. He says, "This is so beautiful, brothers and sisters. If it seems that someone continues to what I love this, anticipate their next failure. You ever had that problem? You're having a problem in a little in your life, and you you just want to quit it, but you keep." blowing it and you know you're going to keep blowing it he says by carrying just too much load from your position key from your position of grace or excuse me your position of faith restore such a person what's a position of faith it's believing the finished work of what god did and accomplished in all human beings you know it says if anyone's in christ they're a new creation that's before that's it's it it says there's no question mark there Everyone's in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, if one man, if one died for all, then all died. And then it goes on to say, because of what Christ did, we're all alive. We're all born from above. 1 Peter 1 says what? It says, I forgot. No, I didn't. It says, we are born again by what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Say, I am born again by the resurrection of Jesus. Not by my confession. My confession is something when I woke up to it. It was already a fact. It didn't. I mean, I had to come to believe to make it really help me a lot. But I think God was watching over us even before we knew that. So, so position of faith, restore such a person in the spirit of courtesy and grace and God's favor. Understanding that God's favor for you is the same as for the other person, no matter what they're doing. Keeping your own attitude in check. Now listen, a legalistic approach would want to suspiciously probe into the problem. And I love this word. It says para, uh, paratoma, para, a close proximity, and pipto means to lose height, stop flying, to fail. Remember, you represent grace and not law. Say, I represent grace, God's favor, and not law. It's separate. It's a dissection. They're different. And it says the promise neutralizes the law. The law neutralizes the promise. Anyway, since everybody likes Psalms 91, here's a good example. Parapipos, things that cause you to stop flying. It says, verse 2, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I lean, rely, and trust in. Okay, verse 3. For he delivers me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Snare of the fowler. Now think about it. In those days, they were hunting birds. They didn't have, they didn't have a gun. They couldn't shoot a bird down. So he had to lay a trap and put some, something down there to get the bird to look away. And it stopped them, to, it stopped them from soaring. Parapipto means things that stop you from flying. It's the same word as transgression, by the way. It says, taking the weight of someone sh off someone's shoulders is a fulfillment of the law of Christ. When you start telling them what God accomplished, in spite of their actions, that's doing that. Now, I want to flip over to the eighth chapter of John, the woman caught in adultery. And I think it's interesting that Rachel posted something about where are your accusers? You know, a little thing. It was great. It was yesterday because I was just reading it. And uh, 
in verse, we'll start in verse three. This is the, you guys all know this encounter, but it's so beautiful. And it's Jesus actually restoring the woman caught in adultery. Wow, by a position of faith. Isn't that interesting? Here's an example. He says right here, meanwhile, the law professors and the Pharisees led a woman to him who was forcefully seized in the act of adultery. Wow, what must have been totally embarrassing. And made her stand in the middle of the throng of the throng of people, a bunch of people, where everyone could stare at her. I mean, bringing just total shame on this poor gal. They said unto him, "Teacher, this woman was caught committing adultery." Now this is now Moses commanded us. Remember, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace, God's favor, and truth, revealing that which is hidden. Then now Moses commands us. You must. In the law, that adulterer should be stoned. What do you say? In other words, Moses tells us to stone her. They obviously had a clear agenda to snare him in their efforts to build a case of lawlessness against him. Of course, so they had an ulterior agenda. We know all this, but this is very interesting. Jesus bent down and began to write with his fingers on the ground, distract, listen to this. No matter what he was writing, everybody's trying to, what did he write? I mean, if you want to know what he, he was writing, he would have told us what he was writing. It doesn't matter. But what matters is he began writing with his fingers on the ground, distracting attention from the girl. Isn't what God does? He said, John, the 12th chapter, he said, when I am lifted up, it says all men, but in the Greek, it's just I will lift all. And so the scripture above I'll lift all men, which is most people don't believe that anyway, are all I'll bring out all judgment on myself. Wow, he's shifting the judgment away, the attention away from the woman to himself. Isn't that interesting? He's, he's going to restore her. They continued to interrogate him. Then he stood up and looked them in the eye, eyes and said, he who is without sin among you. In other words, he who is perfect like God, basically. Let him cast the first stone at her. Now, if I would have been there, if he had said he without sin, I would have said, well, hand me the stone. Because I'm perfect, so are you, according to what God believes. Now, would I want to stone her? No. Would I throw, my, my point is, we're in a new covenant, and it says we've been made perfect. Hebrews 10, 14. He is forever exemplified, completely forgiven and cleansed. You made you perfect. That's what God believes to be true spite of your outward condition. So he again bent down and continued writing on the ground. This is a great time to bring in Matthew 7, which says, judge not, lest you be judged. With the measure you judge, you'll be measured back to yourself. And you know, people run around, yeah, God's going to judge. No, God's not going to judge you. You judge yourself. If you set up a standard, and then you have to make sure everybody lives by that standard, and you can't even do the standard. And he says, what? You're blind by a big old piece of wood. Get it out of your eyes so you can see clearly. You can see exactly what is really going on in love. But anyway, then he, began, he bent down and continued to write. They began to walk away one after another, beginning with the oldest, until Jesus was left alone with the girl, still standing where her accusers dumped her. Now, he deals with the Pharisees. Basically, he, he throws them back. He, throw, he throws the very thing they're judging her back on themselves, which he did a lot. When Jesus stood up again, there was no one there except the woman. So Jesus asked her, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Or what, what Rachel posted, where are your condemners? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? And see, he's restoring her. Watch this. She answered, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, now listen, I'm going to read it wrong. Sometimes reading it wrong is the way to kind of get it in your head. Neither am I condemned you. Go and commit adultery no more. He can say that. Should have. That's what, that's what most people believe. Don't commit adultery no more. Because we just learned, remember Abraham said, willpower has failed us. Willpower has failed us. Where does our willpower come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. Believing correctly about us, and it works naturally. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Self-control, which we all covet, right? The church preaches, but they preach by the law, and, you, and when you bring the law, it actually causes the sin principle in us and causes these actions, by the way, adultery. But he says, he says, neither am I condemning you. 
So when we store somebody, we don't condemn them. And he says, go and sin no more. In other words, again, it says here, never again believe a lie about yourself. In other words, Jesus doesn't attack the problem. He attacks the root of the problem. And that's the root of the problem for all of us. Who are you? Who's your daddy? His name is the Father God. Who are you? I mean, God, your image bearers, your in image and likeness. You are what God says to be true about you. When he sees him, you, he sees himself. You are filled with the Father, Son, and Spirit. You are the temples of the living God. You are as pure as pure as pure as pure and holy. There's no stain of sin. Back over to 1 John 1, 7. God is engulfed in light, the amplifier, or the mirror says. And when we are, get in the light as he's in the light, we see what he sees, because he sees no darkness. He didn't see the darkness. He saw the solution. We know that the blood of Jesus has removed the stain of every sin for everybody. They just haven't woke up to the revelation. Now listen to this. And so, so he says, he doesn't look at the problem. He sees the problem, but he knows, he knows the root of the problem's identity. And the finished work restoring your, is your image and likeness. Now watch. Now the, the solution, which I, I mean, I can't believe I've missed this for like 40 years, but finally figured it out. Because sometimes to me when I read the Bible, it seems like Jesus is on to another subject after that. But the next, verse 12 is the answer to the problem. For both the Pharisees, actually, because they're eating of that tree, so does she in a different way. And they're reaping the sin principle. But Jesus knows the solution. It's faith. Believing the truth about you from God's point of view. Anyway, so verse 12, here's the answer. Here's the answer to the solution. He says, go sin no more. Here's the answer. And Jesus continues to say, I am the light of the world. Whoever journeys with me shall not walk in darkness. You'll see clearly. But will radiate the life, the light of life. In other words, you walk. And if you, and then you just go to 2 Corinthians 3.18. As you behold the mirror of the glory of the Lord, which is you. We're transfigured into his very own image. And from glory to the law, which has some glory to the glory of the moon. And I love this. And this comes from the spirit. Not you doing it. You just beholding Christ. Keep looking at who he is as an example for you. Not, I mean, excuse me, of you, not for you. He's a son of God, son of man. So are you. You're born, Jesus was born from above. So are you. He had a supernatural birth. So do you. Maybe your flesh came from your mom and dad. But your spirit man came from him. Does that make sense? I think that's so beautiful. One other thing is I'm just going to flip over to, since we're doing the John thing, 1 John. 1 John 1, 9, because it's one scripture everybody loves. In other versions, it says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, which is funny because I've been cleansed from all unrighteousness before I confess my sins because it happened on the cross before I was even born. But listen to this. Verse 9. Because he's talking about confession. He says, our conversation takes a brand new dynamic, which means a new power. When we take sides with what God believes about us, so instead of telling God about the details of your mistakes or the things that are out of sorts of who you should be, you remind yourself about the details of your redemption. Remind the details of your redemption. God doesn't need the information. You do, because he already knows. God's faithfulness and righteousness is the basis of our forgiveness. Say this, God's faithfulness and righteousness is the basis of my forgiveness and cleansing from every distortion. That's the basis. It's not your mistakes. It's not confessing your mistakes. Jesus removed every bit of condemning evidence against us. And he did it for, for every person that's making a mistake. And that's how we restore people. We tell them who they are. Homo logo means confession. I've said it a million times. Homo the same. Lego. Root word is logos. Speaking what the word says. What does the word say? Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Hebrews 8. The Lord will remember your sins no more. No more. That's scandalous. It's awesome. All right. Beat that dead. Beat that one to death. Anyone who imagines to be someone they are not lives a lie. Why would you be, who would be imagining in this situation? It's people that are getting caught up in the old legal system. I mean, they didn't, they're Gentiles. Though Paul comes in and preaches this pure gospel. Man, they're flipping out and their lives are changing. 
and they're so full of joy. They're so ecstatic, and the power of God's moving. They're seeing signs and wonders and miracles. The Spirit of God's moving, and then people say, you know, now you got to help God along. And so they get caught up in legalism, and they start having to do what? To live a lie. Just like Adam lived a lie. I mean, he was in God's image and likeness even after he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He just didn't believe it anymore. Now, without pressure of pretense. Now, the word pretense means pretending. Now, without the pressure of pretending. You know, when you get to be a legalistic religious person, you do a lot of pretending. Jesus called them hypocrites. And what is hypocrite? It means play actor. You're acting like something, but you're not, and you can't fulfill it. You are, now listen, say I am free to give expression to my individual self and not some phony life I'm trying to fake. When you're in grace, you get to be you. Say I get to be me. It's the easiest thing I'll ever do. You know, I doubt I can be Stan or June or Trish or anybody else. Very hard. I could try. It's a lot easier just to be me. And God, it wants to give you expression of yourself. You're individually his image bearer. And collectively, we're all different. We look different. We all have different fingerprints. But yet, collectively, we're all the body of Christ. It's pretty wild. Okay. Well, it's not some phony life you're trying to fake. Anybody try to fake a phony life? And, you know, hey, when I came to the Lord, my life was such a mess. And I just was changing and changing and changing until people told me, all the things that I now had to do to get better. And then it went to a screeching halt. And then I just faked the life. And no inside, there's got to be something more to this. How come I was so excited when I first met Jesus? And, oh, geez, I can't take it. I'm going to still go, though, because I know it's the right way. But maybe if I pray harder, read more, go to church more, I'll get more. And I got less. Evaluate your own conduct in such a way that you do not need another's approval to confirm your joy. In other words, your conduct is going to be an expression to what you believe. Now, sometimes we have to separate for not doing anything. Because basically, think about it. We're righteous, holy, well-beloved, sons and daughters of God by faith. But do we do stuff? Paul worked harder than the rest, everybody. And he had the message, didn't he? But the message drove him, compelled him. The love of God compels me right? Everyone ultimately lives their own life. Say, I live my own life. I do not live anybody else's life. Now, this is both student and teacher draw from the same source. In other words, you know, they equally participate in every good thing. The word they share echoes its distinct resonance within them. I'm going to flip over here for just a second. I didn't think about this till just now, but 2 Corinthians, I believe 11, so beautiful, because he says it, they well, student and teacher drop from the same source. Now, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, I feel a divine jealousy for you. And he's, and he's, he's experiencing the same problem with the Corinthians, by the way. I have, as it were, been a, Paul calls himself a groomsman who wooed you to belong solely to your one husband, Christ, and presented you as a pure bride to Christ, right? In other words, Paul, and he, he leads us, he says, I'm a groomsman in a wedding. In the wedding, you're the bride, and Jesus, or you're the bride, bride. Yeah, you're the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. And he does not interfere with that relationship. He stands by and supports it. And he gets, you get the same thing he gets because the, we draw from the same source, which is Christ. The word they share echoes its distinct resonance with this. The word, okay. Show business does not deceive God. Now he's talking, remember, remember, these are, I got to keep saying this. These are people that are getting caught up in legalism after they had the message. This is the context. It will hit it down here, but it's so, you could just, well, oh, what are you talking about? That's what he's talking about. Being some, you know, trying to be big shots and put on his big show. Show business does not deceive God. Do not be led astray because that's what happens. They're being led astray. And then pull your nose up at God as if it was God who led you down. The harvest always reveals the seed. If you sow the, the legalism, you will bear thorns and thistles. If you sow faith and the finished work, you'll sow figs and grapes and all that good stuff. Remember, he's talking to people that are on fire for the Lord because they heard a message. And other people who are from Jerusalem Church, who are believers in Jesus Christ, 
but yet want to bring all their traditions and they want to help the salvation, make you be like them. And that's what bears thorns and thistles. The flesh, remember, it's not your lower nature. It's the fruit of the I am not tree, the tree of the law, which is, if you haven't been here before or heard me say this, it, the law is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What? Yeah. If you do good, then God blesses you. you do bad, he curses you. That's the, that's the tree. But the faith tree is he blesses you and 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 blesses you, and blesses you. gives you life, life, life. The old tree causes a curse and it causes death. And that's all it can cause. If you want to, don't believe me, read 2 Corinthians 3. The spirit can only bring life. The flesh cannot compete with the spirit. That's the old tree. Just like, no, it says, just like with Adam, the fruit of the do-it-yourself tree still, right now, produces death. It still does. You eat of that tree, you die. That's what, he's, that's what this book is about, eating of the tree of life, of grace and faith and promise that solely, solely can be given to you by God, cannot be earned. Do we do stuff? Yeah, I do stuff all the time. If I want to play guitar, I practice, but I read the Bible all the time. Why do I do it? I keep reminding myself and learning more about who God is and the wonderful gift of, that he's given me in Christ Jesus. And it makes me excited. While faith produces what? Spirit fruit. Of the life of the ages, the God kind of life. Say it, the, fl the flesh cannot compete with the spirit. Just like Adam, today the fruit of the do-it-yourself tree, which is the law tree, still produces death. While the opposite, listen to this, the opposite here. Remember 2 Timothy, is it 3.15, I think, when he says, Timothy, study. To so do some study to show yourself a proof, accurately dividing the word of truth. Here he's dividing it. Do it yourself, tree produces death, the opposite. While the faith, while faith, and faith isn't believing, striving to believe, it's believing what just joining in with God's faith and what he believes. While faith produces what? The spirit fruit of the life of the ages, the God kind of life. When now? The Zoe. The God kind of life. Where? In you and all around you, the kingdom of God, where it dwells in you and all around you right now. Every good deed has a predictable harvest. Let's not get discouraged. In the in-between times, let us take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing to everyone we meet without neglecting our fellow our fellow faith family. Okay, I love this. This is, reminds me of texting. To raise the urgency in my voice, I'm. This is this is important. You guys need to get this. The urgency in my voice. I will write the following in my own hand and in large letters. Remember when you're like texting in large letters, that means you're shouting or you really get, trying to get your point across. Paul's really trying to get his point across in this letter. He's writing with his own hand in large letters, capital letters. This is important, the urgency, this message. Those who, I love this, those who urge you to be circumcised are only trying to avoid persecution for the cross of Christ. Avoid persecution for the cross of Christ. What is the cross of Christ? It's the finished work. Do you have to get circumcised? No. Can you get circumcised? Yeah, but it doesn't do you any good. But if you do it as an act of righteousness, you're, it's not. What I mean is if you do it culturally, people do it around the United States, but they're not doing it to be righteous. And, you know, you know, for Abraham's sake, it just becomes a, it became a culture. It's handed down. It started with roots like that, but it's not. You know, my point is, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not. But here he's saying, these people are saying, you must get circumcised. You must obey the Sabbath. Otherwise, you can't be saved. You can't be righteous. And he says, those who are preaching this are avoiding persecution of the cross of Christ. What's the last thing Jesus said? It is finished. Everything. The old covenant is done. All the sin's been dealt with. All the prophecies were summed up. Whoa. That's what he says, prophecy shall cease. Yes. They, you know, I've talked about, is there a prophecy in the New Testament? Actually, the word prophecy there really means being an inspired preacher and teacher. But my point is, I'm talking about the Old Testament prophecies, prophesying of Christ. He showed up. Why do we, they're done. They did their, they did, they, like, what does it say? Carried on this, like a sea, carried a sea to finally being fulfilled. Okay. They prefer to be popular with their fellow Jewish colleagues and thus compromise the message of the cross. What's the compromise? The finished work is not the compromise. The compromise is Jesus did his part. Now you need to do your part. 
Your part is just to believe a message. And actually, you don't even, God just does that automatically because he's put a believer inside of you. When you hear the message, you whoa. To them, it is only an outward sign, it's for circumcision, in the flesh that matters. It is not even so much for the law that they are concerned. Paul's calling them out here. They just want to boast in the flesh as a sign that they successfully recu recruited you for their cause. And go, like, yeah, look at all the people I led to the Lord or led to Jesus. May my boasting be in nothing but what the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing but the finished work, Paul says. What happened on the cross? We were co-crucified, we were co-raised, and we co-ascended before we even knew it, Ephesians 2. While we were dead in our trespasses and sins. I've, I keep repeating these scriptures, but they're so wonderful. What did he do? He raised you up with Christ, gave you the life of Christ, and gave you joint seating by virtue of being in Christ, in union with Christ, face to face with the Father. And all we did is wake up when we heard the message, like, oh my Lord, who am I face to face with? So I will boast of nothing but the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world is the world system of the legalism, which is not just in the, in the tablets. It's also just in the world, the competition. And, you, you know, you have to do this to commend yourself. And if you do this, you're bad. Instead of what how Christ defines you. The religious systems and applause of this world have no appeal to me. As far as they're concerned, I'm a dead man. The new creation. In Christ steals the show, not whether someone is circumcised or not. Say, I am a new creation. I steal the show. That's what God believes. Even if it's not happening, I'll just keep saying it. I steal the show. I'm a new creation. And you know, aren't we just waking up to the reality of who we really are as new creations, sons and daughters of God? And over in Romans 8, 19, the whole creation is waiting for who to appear? Us. As we figure out who we are, whoa. And it becomes bigger and bigger every day. Our union with Christ, our oneness, sets the pace and makes, uh, makes us the true Israel. Not whether we are Jew or Gentile, circumcised or not. Oh, what peace we discover in his mercy. Sad ah, peace, which is, remember, it's a dovetail joint. Irene, it's a oneness. There's no intimidation, inferiority. You're face to face with the Father right now. This Rule is a new law we submit ourselves to as a principle of our daily walk. And I'll just flip over to uh, Romans 8, verse 2, I believe. The law of the spirit of life is the liberating force of the life in Christ. This leaves me with no further obligation to the law of sin and death. No obligation. Spirit has superseded the sin enslaved senses as the principle of the law of our lives. Commentary. The law of the spirit is righteousness by faith. Say, I am righteous because I believe. Say, I can't possibly get better than righteous. You can't be better than righteous. So don't even try. That doesn't mean you should have bad behavior, by the way. But you don't want to. The more you know who you are, the more your behavior changes. Effortlessly, you're not like addicted to nutsy behavior like the sin principle. And that's when we obey the law. Self-righteousness, which produces condemnation and spiritual death is what the fruit of the do-it-yourself tree is. All right. Verse 17, I will not be troubled anymore. I already bear enough scars in my body that brand me as being under the ownership of Jesus. These scars that I carry from being persecuted for this gospel are more significant to me than the scars of circumcision. Brothers and sisters, may the what revelation, the unveiling of what God's favor, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not unmerited favor. I don't care what the Amplified says. It's favor. You deserve it because you're born into the family. You know, we go to back to, well, look at my actions. There's unmerited favor. No. I get favor because of Jesus Christ. People just had that mentality. It's, unmer it's not unmerited favor. You deserve the favor by faith. You don't, can't earn it, though. It's the key. The revelation of grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be the rule of your spirit. So the unveiling of the grace of the Lord be the rule, understanding his favor, understanding his work, understanding how he sees you, and he has no darkness. He sees the pure you. He sees with pure light. He's removed every stain of sin. He, you're just full, so full of light right now. You're, you're just like the transfiguration. You guys are beaming light right now. You don't think you are, but you are. The more we probably 
believe that, the more we walk around and we'll be so full of light, people will be walking around with sunglasses. And I'm not saying, what is going on with you? And then what they'll join the, join the crowd, join the resurrection parade with Jesus. And that's it. <laughs>